Hello Kings, Queens, Nerds, and Geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back, guys, to another Fallout Equestria, you guys. Now, this is a very special chapter. It's going to be a special chapter, uh, chapter 37.4, because this is about Pinkie Pie, my absolute favorite pony, and it's going to mean a lot to me. You know what? Hold on. I'll be right back. I'm going to grab something just for the occasion of this video. Hold on. I'll be there. Alrighty. Ah. I don't edit these videos. You probably you guys probably have a long a bit of a silence there. So hold on. As you can see, I brought my pinky plushie with me today. So she's gonna sit here right on the desk with me. I'm gonna put her right here in the background so you guys can see her. And um, let's uh, get on with the video. So here we go. So remember, guys, I am been looking forward to doing this video. And oh god. I kept my eyes closed, holding to the piece of rest just a little longer. I was alive, and I felt uninjured. Even the headaches had gone away. I wanted to stay like that just a little while longer, because waking up meant returning to my life, and that meant pain. It also meant friends. I had no desire to stay asleep forever, just a little while longer, a few minutes. It's all I wanted. The noises around me were strange. Gravelly voices, the clopping of hoofsteps, and the high-pitched whine that had been ever-present throughout my childhood. The Alcorns had set up a trap. A scarily clever one, too. When I had fallen into the reflecting pool, the Alcorns had observed how I dealt with traps by using my telekinesis. And this time, they had not only anticipated it, but used it against me with a trap that attacked me faster through my magic. The realization was terrifying. I had no idea why it didn't work. They should have killed all of us. My eyes opened to the overly familiar sight of a stable clinic ceiling. Wait. What? Welcome to Stable City, rumbled the voice of a stallion standing nearby. His eyes glowed as his broad body shambled towards me, the filthy evening cloak on his back having melted into his skin. I looked around. The architecture hit all the familiar stable notes, but every pony around me was a canterlot ghoul. The ghoul stallion stopped, drawing my attention. Now we've treated you and your friends. Consider that on the house for the show your party put on yesterday. We in the stable city are willing to extend the benefit of the doubt to any pony who those monsters hate so much. He reached up a fetid hoof and tapped my horn warningly. I could see he wore pit buck. It was melted his flesh just like mine. Only his had a broadcast. I almost forgot that. Oh one that had been mercifully switched off. But only so far. The broadcasters in the foyer keep those monsters outside. Most of us have taken to wearing them as well, in case we need to step out. He saw my eyes widen. Don't worry. None of us keep them on while we're inside. The static is highly annoying, unless we're on guard patrol. Or unless you give us a reason to. One wrong step and every citizen of Stable City becomes walking death, you living folk. So you and your breather friends behave now. Clear? I nodded. Very clear. Now, I believe there's someone who's been waiting. The ghoul stallion one? began, only to be cut off by the sound of a squeal from Velvet Remedy somewhere nearby. Oh, uh, seems to have found your other unicorn first. The ghoul concluded, but I had already jumped down and was racing through the clinic, dodging between ghouls. I slid to a stop as I spotted Velvet, then trotted forward, feeling a warm smile break across my muzzle. She was sitting up in a medical bed, her face full of joy, with pyrelight dancing gleefully through the air around her. Good day, gentle ghouls of Stable City, you miserable rotting slabs of ambulatory meat, the floating robot called out greeting random citizens of Stable City as they passed in the hall. Calamity walked beside me, having found the hallway of the stable too confining to fly in. The ghouls gave us an odd and curious look as they passed. Lil Pip, you lost part of yourself, Calamity was saying. 
I looked down at my pit buck foreleg, and a pain frown immediately swept over my muzzle. I forced myself to smile. Eh, more like added something, actually. Don't you use specific details to muddy the issue, Calamity warned. Truth is, a loss like that pains a pony, and I'm not talking just physically. And it ain't brave to pretend you ain't hurting inside. It ain't smart, neither. I stayed silent. When Velvet Remedy lost her leg, Calamity recalled. She was a right mess, even after we got her back on. Sorry, Calamity, I chuckled wryly. But I don't think I'll be indulging in the same therapy. Don't be a manacle's backside, little Pip, Calamity said crossly. Stubborn? When we get out of here, we need to get back to Ten Pony Tower, and y'all need to spin. A man don't be a manicorn's backside? And there goes my phone. Of course, it'll be an email. About Teespring. Uh... No. I barked. I looked at Calamity, his wings up and eyes wide clearly taken aback by my abruptness and the strength of my refusal. More pleasantly, I complained, We've become experts at not getting what we need to do done. After Canterlot, we go straight to Splendid Valley. No more delays, no more side quests, no more distractions. We get the damn job done. Calamity didn't speak for a while. In the background, I could hear the robot saying, Hello, ma'am. I do hope the morning finds you in good health. As if that could ever happen. We rounded the corner and found ourselves looking at a stable atrium. The place had been renovated to hold a plethora of shops and small stands where Canterlot ghouls traded goods and services for bits and wares. As we stared down the stairs, Calamity asked me softly, Are you okay, little Pip? It was a stupid question, considering the conversation immediately prior. But I ignored that as I heard the concern in his voice. I'm weary, Calamity. I'm getting worn out, I admitted dourly. I need this job to be over, to get out from under this threat, this mission. I looked up, scanning the stable city marketplace. Then, after that, I can rest. Maybe when this is all over, I'll just lay down and take a nap for a century or few, but not before. We reached the bottom of the steps. The place looked like a right lively little necropolis. The only thing that struck me as missing were any sort of diner or foodstuff vendors. I suppose ghouls didn't really need those, though. I was suddenly keenly aware of how hungry I was and how long it had been since I'd eaten. How about you? I asked in return as we approached a store labeled Calibers, Guns, and Ammo. Me? I'm doing... He paused as I turned to him and pointedly raised an eyebrow. Oh, it ain't fair throwing my own words back at me. Hey, I didn't see anything. He neighed. Then, brushing his brow beneath his desperado hat, he admitted, I ain't doing so good, actually. I keep thinking about them bandits back in Arbu, and the ponies up at Buckland Cross. He frowned. Don't remind me of Arbu. Nah, the bandits I can rightly live with. According to the old man, half of them came from Arbu, but they were still bandits. They were still ambushing the merchant. He looked at me. And y'all think being a ban Okay, guys, uh, this is unrelated, but um, I, I remember when I was playing Fallout 3 again, I was playing Fallout 3 again, I remember coming across the Hunters, and um, I, re I remember my, my friend Boz telling me about the strange meat actually being human flesh. Um, um, so that reminded me, so I'm guessing the hunters are in their version of Arbu in this situation because they're like, it's fine, it's good eating. I remember when I first encountered um, hunters in Fallout that they were hunting on a girl right next to Robco, to a Robco industry. And um, that was the, they were telling me they wanted to sell me some strange meat. Seriously. I am. I. I. Uh, I remember after I left Robco, they were still there. I shot him down dead. Bandit is downright noble. Step up from being what folks in Arbu were, but from my perspective, the moment those folks in Arbu started killing folk for their meat, they weren't no better than bandits. I nodded. My own feelings were considerably different. 
but my horrific actions in Arbu voided any validity those feelings might have had. But Buckland Cross... That's a different matter entirely. Calamity shook his head, nickering bitterly. We went there demanding something, and ended up killing him for it. That... My jaw dropped. Calamity, that's not how it went down at all. We tried to negotiate. They fired first. We were trying to get something they didn't need to give to the ponies who were suffering without it. We had something to trade, and were trying. They risked their elder's life. We... we weren't raiders. Ain't it? He asked me, clearly unsure. Ain't it just a little how that went down? I stomped, shaking my head. No, that's not how it went down, Calamity. Still unconvinced, Calamity stepped up to the door of the weapons shop. If you take from the rich and give to the poor, you're still a raider, he said as the door slipped up. No, I said firmly. You're not. A bandit, maybe, at best, but not a raider. And you know better. I couldn't believe my kleptomaniac Pegasus was arguing this. Some would call you a hero. Buckling Cross had to be disturbing Calamity deeply for his thoughts to have plunged into such uncharacteristic and messy logic. Maybe Velvet was right, and we all needed years of therapy. Stepping into the store after him, I put a hoof on his shoulder. Then, not knowing how else I could help, I hugged him. Not in my shop. The little dead colt behind the store counter coughed in disgust. If you're looking for that, it's two floors up. The colt shoved the missiles across the counter to Calamity. One or two of these anti-armor missiles are pretty much guaranteed to take down an alicorn's shield and make a very pretty mess of the winged bitch inside. He looked at what Calamity was offering in return. Leave it to Calamity to not only retrieve all of our weapons and supplies, but to go through the garbage for anything else that might be good for trade. This all gets you five. Toss in one of those magical energy weapons, and I can give you all eight. Calamity raised an eyebrow. He was no velvet remedy, but he had fair bartering chops of his own, and I could tell he thought he was being snookered. Three missiles don't equal the top of the line magical energy weapon, not even if they're all fancy as you claim they are. The cold bit. Oh, they are. One of the benefits of living in the Ministry of Wartime Technology. We have all sorts of toys you living folk haven't even heard of. I was willing to bet he was right. I was also willing to bet most of it was either in questionable prototype stages or stocked in too limited a supply to sell. So if these work so well against Alicorn shields, then why haven't you used them against the Alicorns? I asked reasonably. It had not been hard to glean that the ghouls of Stable City had been fighting with the Alicorns since they started showing up in the Canterlot ruins about a decade ago. From the impression I got, the ghouls were losing, and were now effectively contained in the ministry they called home. The cult frowned. Eight missiles ain't much use against a few dozen of those winged bitches. That magic rifle on the other hoof, that can rack up quite the kill count over a couple years of sniping. Calamity whinnied. Well then, sounds to me like the rifle's worth all eight. But I'll give it to you for six, and we'll just come with the element of generosity. The colt made the trade, although from his expression he'd been calling Calamity quite a few of other things shortly after we left. <laughs> now, what do y'all have for rifle ammo? The colt shook his head, giving a snorting chuckle. Sorry, can't help you. If you want ammo, you'll have to look elsewhere. Calamity blinked then made an exaggerated act of reading up the store sign. I thought the name of the store was Calibers, Guns, and Ammo. How do you not have ammo? You only sell two things. Ha <laughs> ha, the little ghoul said dryly. My ammo's all stored in an ammo vendor for safekeeping. Only the damn thing is busted and I can't get it to dispense. So no ammo. Calamity began to smile. Oh, I bet I can fix that for you. For what? Say, a 10% discount on ammo. I thought Velvet Remedy would have been proud of him for that. Oh, yeah! The Colt's school eyes lit up, literally, as he asked. Definitely. If you're sure you can do it. Calamity laughed. With the number of times I've broken into them things at Pilfrum, I reckon it might just do my karma some good to fix one up for once. He 
and gave me a wink. I just Our realized. Conversation uh, still hung in the. I just realized how intertwined Fallout Equestria is because it kind of intertwines all versions of the game, especially New Vegas. Because I'm guessing that's where um, calamity calamities East source comes from, and where he was drink drinking the sunset sarsaparillas and stuff. I'm realizing that each of these characters have originality from probably each game, and um, of course, I'm guessing the Fallout arm power armor. I'm get. I know there's power armor in the first two games, but I'm guessing the the power armor thing is gonna be um, from one or two from for steel hooves. Um, the medical pony, uh, such as as um, so, uh, the two me uh, the medical pony. Uh, fuck, why do I keep forgetting names? Velvet. And of course, Little Pip are the origination of the father and son of Fallout 3. We got Fallout New Vegas for Calamity. Um, I have no idea about about, um, Zac about uh, not Zakora, Zenith. I don't know about that one because I haven't played the first two. Although I should look up some emulators, see if I can find those. I, I might do a fucking Fallout 1 and 2 series. Um, but I have to find those games first. So, Well, anyway, let's continue on air, but it was good to see Calamity in brighter spirits. Calamity rubbed his hoof on the colt's head. Don't worry, Uncle Calamity will have it taken care of very quickly. He flew over the counter and trotted back towards the modified Iron Shots ammo emporium vending machine, leaving the ghoul coat staring at him in disdain for a moment. I'm a century older than you. So, what can you tell me about this place? I asked Caliber the twelve-decade-old canterlot ghoul in the body of a colt as he watched Calamity work. He had half of the machine taken apart already, and occasionally graced us with a yep or a dab Oh my god, that reminds me of B Billy the Kid in the fridge. Oh god. Ah, I just remember that. This kid is... I, I, Billy the Kid in the fridge in Fallout 4, he's not probably candid to this because this is before Fallout 4, but... Billy the Kid, if you guys have played it, was a kid you find in a fridge and you help him find his family or you sell him. So either way, that's your choices. Or there you could sell him and then kill the owner or, and so you can free him again. So, but there you go. It's a gun shop. Calamity snarked. I sell guns. And usually, ammo. <coughs> what do you mean here at Stable City? I clarified. We're new around here. Calibre put on airs of false surprise. Really? You mean there haven't been two breathers living in Stable City that I just hadn't noticed? I brushed it off, asking, How did a group of ghouls end up living in a stable? Calibre sighed, quickly giving up on deflating my desire to pester him with questions. Stable One was built to protect the princesses, the nobility, the government officials, and the higher-ups of the ministries. Or at least that's what Stable Tech told every pony. They built Stable One in this building because apparently the top ponies of Stable Tech and the Ministry of Wartime Technology were real chummy. Well, yes. They were sisters. Anyway, when the pink cloud came, a whole bunch of ponies from all around, mostly from the castle and the ministries, tried to gallop over to Stable One, hoping they could get in. After all, while they were safe from the pink cloud in the ministry buildings, except possibly for the Ministry of Peace, only Stable One had a long-term food supply. It was coming here or starve. Of course, all those ponies had to run through the cloud to get here, and a whole lot of them didn't make it. Those who did found the fuckers already in Stable One closed it early. They were once again trapped in a safe haven without food, and then most of them expired overnight, having suffered just enough exposure to turn them into ghouls. They didn't need food anymore after that, so it all worked out. Chromatic Justice and Stable Tech pretty much killed all the ponies in Stable One. The ghouls already started the town inside the building by the time it opened up. When they added the resources of Stable One, the town became Stable City. I listened intently. How about you? I asked Caliber once he was done. Ugh. He groaned. Are all breathers this nosy? I have some thought. 
I know, I don't know about the Brotherhood of Steel, about ghouls. I know they kill ferals, um, but I, but what are they about regular ghouls, such as, you know, um, I do, I do know that there was this gang in Fallout 4, um, that was, consisted of, uh, excuse me, ghouls and humans and stuff like that. Yeah, some of them were pre-war ghouls, too, and, um. And that reminds me of Vault 88, uh, which had, or was it Vault 81? I think it was either Vault 81 or Vault 88, and they had their own set of ghouls. Had their own set of ghouls. Actually, no, actually it was just one ghoul and several ferals and a few glowing ones. And plus, throughout the vault you find other creatures such as death claws, uh, Myolurks, queens and kings, stuff. Well, not, maybe not Myolurk kings, but... They had Myrlurk, um, other type, Myrlurk hunters and stuff in there. Um, but either way, there was a bunch of stuff in there. Um, and that involved ghouls. Um, the, does the Brotherhood of Steel I'll accept ghouls? Because I do know that this particular ghoul, Steel Who, started, was in the, was in the Steel Rangers. So do they also have their set of ghouls within the Steel Rangers, just like Steel Hooves? Come on, he's been a ghoul for 200 years, and he's... Damn. Yeah, I said, just because I could. Fine. I was born in Stable 3. Stable 3 was constructed underground. He looked at me expectantly, then sighed when it became clear I didn't know how big a deal that was. You think the pink cloud out there is bad? That's nothing. You go underground to any of the sewers and maintenance tunnels under the rails, and you'll see bad. Then, being a breather, you'll die. It's solid pink down there. Down there, the pink cloud's alive and hungry. It's only a matter of time before it finds its way in. That got a jump from me, followed by a look of disbelief. Of course, ponies like you scoff. The one alicorn over tried talking to us instead of attacking us scoff too. But I tell you true. Pink Cloud's alive down there. I've heard it's breathing. Caliber shrugged. Then the colt ran off in breathless rapid succession. <clears throat> anyway, Pink Cloud got me. I died. Became a ghoul. So did my parents. Pink Cloud ate stable three. So, wait. so it came here. Then wait. Out. Wait, you have to die to become a ghoul in this universe? Well, even in Fallout, you have to, you have to be transformed. You are doused with radiation. You don't die. You just mutate. Fallout has that thing. Like they even created a small. Like there was this. Um, I know this is a fake vault, but Vault One Ten Eighty. Um, they were just making ghouls. In fact, there was um, uh, Eddie from Eddie. There was a uh, Eddie uh, Eddie White uh, in Fallout Four. You actually go on a mission with Luke Valentine. Sorry, not Luke. Nick. Nick Valentine. Why did I say Luke Valentine? Nick Valentine to find Eddie White in the old times. And you find out that he turned himself into a ghoul to preserve on in the next 200 years. He'd been locked away. And you finally find him. So there you go. Alicorns came and killed my parents. Now, it's just me. Which is fine, because I'm old enough to be your grandfather's great-grandfather. I run a gun store. I sell guns to ammo. Usually. Ta-da. We've come full circle. Question time over now. Calamity had stopped his work and was looking at me with a knowing expression. While Caliber wasn't looking, he mouthed. We need to talk. A dragon? Yep. Calamity claimed as we trotted towards the open door of Stable One. A big mammoth behemoth super old dragon. Just beyond stretched a large, open area of the Ministry Building, which had once been used for processing. But the ghouls had converted it into some sort of liberal arts common room. I just thought... Behemoth. The word Behemoth. What is this universe's versions of Behemoth Super Mutants? Because I remember fighting in a few of those in the games. I, I fought Swan, I fought the Behemoth Super Mutant that's required to defeat in the uh, Fallout 3 game. And several other kinds, but what is this equivalence version of the super behemoth? I wonder if any of you guys could answer that. 
A two-pony band had started playing, one on a glass harp, and the other on a glass harmonica. The music that floated through Stable One's entrance was beautifully haunting, crystalline, and strangely disorienting. It was the music of ghosts. How is the pink cloud a dragon? I asked, confusion overcoming my initial shock. Well, it's not. Not quite exactly, anyhow. Calamity struggled. It's, uh, it's weird, okay? Look, you know how the zebra bale fire bombs work, right? They take a bale fire egg and weave it into a mega spell. Talisman thingy. Something like that. Anyway, the pink cloud mega spell was the same way. It took a bunch of those things they use against Littlehorn, which best I figure are essentially like water talismans, only for pink cloud. And they woke them into a mega spell talisman thingy. Okay. I said, nodding. I was fairly sure I was following what Calamity was saying better than he did. But how does that... Well, if you want to build a talisman that's going to last a long time, or at least last long enough to kill someone who you've really hard to put down, what do you make it out of? Oh. I had a sinking feeling in my gut. You use gemstones. I paused as we reached a water fountain. Stable One had a functioning water talisman. I tested the fountain, holding my pit buck leg close to it, but there was no sign of contamination. I ran it a bit, but there was no hint of pink, either. Yep, Calamity said as I gulped down water from the fountain. It was not quite a true substitute for food, but it would do for now. This pink cloud mega spell talisman was just chock full of gemstones. I saw where this was going now. The dragon ate it, didn't he? Yep, and the dragon's what? a she. The dragon that guards the royal treasury, to be exact. Oh no. As we reached the entryway, oh, I paused, no. observing a glowing terminal. Oh, My no. curiosity got the better of me. Hold up, I asked Calamity. I poked at the terminal, and was surprised to find that it had already been hacked, and the information on it was freely available to any pony who was interested. The information consisted of a single audio file. I downloaded it to my... foreleg. Turning back to Calamity, I commented, You could just say okay, Pitbuck. Okay, now the secret passage makes sense. How do you figure? Well, Princess Celestia's school was obviously using baby dragons for something. Well, they had to come from somewhere, I reasoned. I think the princess had some sort of arrangement with the dragon. She got the biggest horde in Equestria, and the princess got, well, her children. The royal treasury dragon was Mommy. Calamity nodded. Well, seems the dragon digested the mega spell or something. It changed her, became part of her. Right now, she's asleep in the treasury, and she's snoring pink cloud. Well, fuck it. It's probably fuck. also a ghoul. I now understood how Canterlot's pink cloud survived after centuries of week long rains. And why the cloud was so dense in underground passages. Well, think about it. Uh, think about it here. Look at all those baby dragons who've been ghoulified by the pink cloud. Like, you gotta think about that. That means that Mama here, Mama Pink Dragon, or whatever, I don't know what the fuck to call her. That means that she's most likely a ghoul. If she hadn't died, she's probably a ghoul. So, and it's pretty obvious she hadn't died. So she's most likely a ghoul. So she's going to be fucking five times harder to kill. Come on, look at fucking... Uh, look at Steel Hooves. Look how hard he is to kill, and he's a good guy. Usually bad guys have that problem. Of being hard to kill. That in this universe, ghouls are hard to kill. You have to cut their fucking heads off, off, or give some truly fatal headshots to make them truly die. Burn them alive, something. Burn them while they're still down, and you gotta make sure they're dead. I'm gonna guess they're gonna find some way. They're probably gonna waste those fucking six missiles on that bitch. Why am I talking like this? Why am I freaking out about this? If this is a dragon, they've killed the dragon. They're their best friends with a dragon. What the fuck? 
the cloud would have gotten into the secret passage, started eating away at its walls, and from there, it would have gone... everywhere. Sewers, tunnels, you name it. And she probably don't look nothing like a dragon anymore, either. Calamity mused. You gotta figure, she's fused to a horde. The whole damn treasury. He kicked at the metal railing next to the steps out. So much of a dreams of looting the royal treasury. Such a waste. I rolled my eyes, then asked, How do you know all this anyway? Calamity turned to me. Cause while y'all were vacationing, I was stuck down in the hole with the crazy alicorn lady. Y'all just got a few minutes of Looney Town. I had that damn argument run through my head nonstop all damn night. He let out a loud nicker. I picked up a few things from all of that. A sign hanging on the wall next to the stable's gear-shaped mall read, Artistic Commons, no broadcasters please. We stepped out through the open gear-shaped door and paused, hearing the music more fully now. I felt the urge to move aside somewhere, lay down, forget about dragons and necromantic clouds and everything else, to just listen as the ethereal tones moved strangely through my soul. Calamity and I were still in the artistic commons, lulled by the music, when Steelhose found us. The armor-clad ghoul trotted up heavily, stopping for us just long enough to demand, Come with me. He was trotting back through the crowd of Canterlot ghouls before I even fully registered his presence. I struggled to my hooves, feeling sluggish, relaxed, and strangely off-balance. Calamity stretched his wings, giving a few lazy flaps before lifting himself into the air. The ceiling of the processing area was three ponies high, giving him just enough room to maneuver between the maze of ghouls, easels, and displays from below, and the light fixtures above. Steelhoofs kept a brisk pace, weaving dispassionately between the residents of Stable City. I had to wonder what it was like for him. He had expected nothing but poison, death, and monsters in the Canterlot ruins. And while those existed in great abundance, we had also found a pocket of civilization a community composed of Canterlot ghouls like himself. As we started climbing one of the several flights of stairs, my stomach rumbled, again protesting my lack of proper breakfast or lunch. I distracted myself by putting in my ear bloom and playing the audio recording from the Stable One terminal. The voice was very familiar, which made the beginning of the recording all the more jarring. There was a wetness in her voice. She had clearly been crying. But no more. Now, while the bitterness and sorrow remained, the hurt was gone, and a cold anger had nested in its place. Hello, and goodbye. My name is Scootaloo. You probably know me as the Vice President of StableTech, the company who designed and built the stable you've taken refuge in. But right now, I'm talking to you as one of the very, very, very many ponies you fuckers have murdered. You, the Ministries, the Heads of Equestria, the princesses, if you're in here. You killed us all with your stupid, senseless war. And now, I'm returning the favor. I'll admit, I gave a lot of serious thought to just keeping the door of Stable One from sealing properly, and letting you all die from whatever horror you hid yourselves from while the rest of the Canterlot ponies and all the rest of Equestria perished. All... all the ponies that we were unable to save. But that's the whole point of the stables. Above and beyond everything else, the stables are meant to save people. Yes, people. I'm happy to report that one of the stables has been built to save as many of Equestria Zebras as possible, the ones that you fuckers shoved into a dump and tried to forget about. And Stable 14 is currently housing many of Equestria's Griffins. But the stables are mostly built to save ponies. Even ponies like you. It is for that reason alone that you're all going to live out the rest of your natural lives in Stable 1, as will your children, regardless of the conditions existing outside. I've seen to it that Stable One will not open so long as even one of you is still alive, which, if the princesses are in there, might be a very, very long time. No matter how fast Equestria heals, not a single damn one of you is going to get a profit from what you've done. Equestria is something that you ponies don't deserve. I hope your souls rot for eternity. 
Seal has led us to the border of Stable City, a once rather drearily officious room labeled Ministry of Wartime Technologies. That's why the door opened. And Scootaloo cursed it. Scootaloo was so full of rage, so much rage at the, of the war, that she was willing to curse the entire royalty in Stable One. Holy shit. Think about that. That's 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 some deep shit right there. That's personal level shit. Like I have heard of Vault Tech doing their most horrible things. Like for example, Stable 95 was just to consist of drug addicts who had just been recovering and they were slowly trying to recover. They're basically the overseer act as a therapist, um, a, a life coach trying to help them out for the problems. She was not aware of what vault Tech was about to do. vault Tech basically did this. They hired, they had a guy disguise himself in. He went in, pretended to be an addict, just like the rest. And here we go. And for five, he waited five, he was given the orders to wait five years. Five years! And this is what he did. He opened up a secret compartment in the vault which was filled with nothing but drugs, chems, and alcohol. And what happened after that, all the people who thought they were cured, all the people who didn't think they needed it, they lost it. Some it came out immediately, some didn't. And some took a while and gave in to their addiction. And they, and they're in, that, in that little compartment was a lifetime supply of chems and they had eaten, taken it all within a few days. They killed them all. And you gotta understand, these people were going through cleansing processes, even a thing that can get rid of a physical addiction. Um, and then there was another vault. Um, which was it? Um, it was Vault 81. Now I remember which vault it was now, by the way. Vault 81. Its entire purpose was to test out viruses. It was originally designed to bring out the virus, it was to create viruses and bring them to, and test them on the vault dwellers and try to cure them. This probably would have ended bad if the overseer was too scared to let it happen. So this is what she did. She never, she disabled all the uh, ventilation systems from ever being spraying the virus. They had locked the scientists in there. She had locked the scientists in there and left them to die. So that way they can never harm a single human being by planting a virus within the vault. This is what I'm talking about. The vault tech is fucked up. But this isn't about testing. This, this is revenge. Subsidy Application Center, which have been converted into a defense position complete with turrets, armored wall reinforcements, and barricades with murder holes, and to a door that had been canvassed with welded armored plates. Steel have stopped raising an armored forehoof and banging it against the door in four impatient raps. He waited for a moment, nickering softly to himself. Steelhoofs, what's all this about? I asked, disquieted by the mood radiating from him. I noticed he was carrying a saddle satchel that he had never worn before. He didn't answer, still nickering. Just as I began to suspect he was counting, he stopped. Steelhoofs opened the armored door and barged inside, passing a displeased-looking cantalot ghoul who stood guard. Clammy and I followed. I waved to the guard as we passed, observing his battle saddle, armor, and the pit-buck on his leg. His broadcaster was turned off. I realized quickly the purpose of Steelhoofs' knock. The guard did not return my greeting. Feeling a wave of depression, I noticed his pit-buck was not part of him. I suspected most of the hip bucks worn by ghouls of Stable City had been acquired from Stable One, or the residents therein. 
With the right tools and knowledge, it was impossible to open a pit buck and lock it onto a new body. However, the pit buck technician's stall in Stable 1 should have both the tools and the documentation the Canterlot ghouls needed. I tried to buck up. Feeling morose about my leg was not going to help anything. The emotion didn't even make sense. As we moved forward, I found myself staring out at a wall of pink. We had exited on an upper mezzanine overlooking the atrium. Dim pink tinted light flooded the once grand atrium. The cloud was thick enough outside that we would need to drink healing potions after making a run between each ministry building now. Down below, we could hear the sea of static from dozens of broadcasters hidden amongst the skeletons that littered the floor. Luckily, we were high enough to be out of danger. Feeling a flood of deja vu, I moved up the railing and looked down. I had been here before. From this very spot, I had looked down into a much sunnier lobby as Applejack spoke openly with her old zebra friend, Zakora. I had watched, and my host had plotted Applejack's demise. I shied away from the railing with a shudder of disgust. Steelhose was looking back at me from several yards ahead. This way. The place our Applejack's ranger led us to was an odd little alcove underneath a sweeping stairwell. The door had long ago been removed, and a simple stained curtain hung in its place. Warm light poured out from underneath the hanging drapery, as well as above it and along the sides. Steelhose knocked on the wall beside the curtain this time almost reverently. Star, he rumbled gently. It's Apple Snack. I've returned with as many of the things you asked for as I could find, and I've brought my friends. Although I had counted Steelhoves amongst my friends for weeks, to hear him refer to us this way was surprising, strange, and poignant. Oh, bless you, dearie. An elderly mare's voice rasped from inside, followed by an odd squeaking. Please, come on inside. Star. Stilos pushed past the curtain without hesitation. With a mixture of caution and wonder, I stepped in behind him. The room under the stairs was small, lit by a couple old sparkle cola lamps sitting on old metal boxes. There was a clean-looking toilet in the near corner with several pristine coffee mugs sitting on a few shelves. The back half of the room was sectioned off by a once-beautiful hanging curtain originally rich hues of scarlets and purples, but now faded and fraying. Much of the wall directly opposite the door was taken up by a rusty ventilation grate, the fan behind it slowly turning. The only other notable furniture amongst the clutter was an ancient phonograph sitting beside a player for more modern audio recordings. I immediately pictured this room as having originally been a little getaway from some janitor or maintenance pony, a place she could sneak off to during her shift to smoke, relieve herself, or do other things. Living in this secluded and somewhat sad place, outside of Stable City, yet still within the Ministry building itself, was a mare who had been elderly even before the pink cloud made her undying. She was a unicorn, her body fused into a wheelchair to which she had largely been confined, even before. My first assumption upon seeing the curtain was that the next room held a mattress, but I realized now that not only did Tantralite ghouls not sleep, but this mare was not even able to lay down and rest. Still, she greeted us with a smile, her eyes wide and glowing. Thank you, Apple Snack, she beamed at us. It's been a long time since I've had some visitors. Steel have set the saddle satchel on the floor. I'm sorry I could not find everything, Star. A violet light manifested around the unicorn ghoul's horn and enveloped the satchel. <laughs> oh, this is lovely, Star said floating out several records and a few audio recordings. you saved this old mare, Apple Snack. Truly you have. Books levitated out next. I was going to go insane if I had to read the same dusty old books one more time. She gasped as she pulled out a few boxes of old snack cakes. Oh, how thoughtful of you. The elderly ghoul's smile was somehow beautiful, despite the condition of her decayed and warped body. I may not need to eat, but it is so wonderful to occasionally taste sweetness. I looked at Steelhose. His stance was almost bashful. I could almost feel a warmth radiating off the normally dour and stoic ghoul. The elder mare paused, a ghost of a tremble passing through her lower lip. She swiveled away, turning the wheels of her chair with her magic, 
likewise magically tugging at the curtain to dab her left eye. The chair squeaked as she rotated. I noticed the larger wheels were still functional, but the smaller ones had fused rigid. The movement of the curtain revealed the wall behind was plastered with posters and images. I couldn't make any of them out, save that lavender seemed to be the dominating color, and that one of the posters boasted the word, Read. As the curtain fell back into place, I realized two things. First, I had no idea why the old ghoul had emotionally reacted to what my mind had labeled as a shopping run, and second, she had been unable to wipe the tear away with a hoof because her forelegs were melted into the leg rest of the chair. I felt an involuntary shudder, trying to imagine living forever, but being unable to move. I immediately wanted to help this poor mare, and I felt very proud of Steelhose for doing what he did. But where are my manners? Star asked abruptly, turning back with a big smile on her face as she floated the contents of the satchel away. And where are yours? she said without a hint of malice. You haven't introduced your friends. Steelhose whinnied, then turned to look at us. Clamity had been staring at him with eyebrows raised so high they nearly pushed off his hat. But now he broke into an almost smug grin. Yeah, Apple Snack. What say you introduce us and quit hogging this pretty young gal all for yourself? Clamity shot Star a warm smile and a mirthful wink. She rolled her eyes, smiling. Star, this is Little Pip, he said, nodding to me. And the Pegasus is Calamity. Little Pip, Calamity. This is Star Sparkle. Howdy, Miss Sparkle, Calamity said. Sparkle! My smile of greeting faltered a moment. No way! Is that who I think it is? Is that Twilight's mom? Star Sparkle. That's Twilight Sparkle's mom. I think it is. It sound. It sounds like her name. It's so. Oh my God. Why her mom? And why is she in a wheelchair? Who? She's living here outside Sable City because she's being shunned. Steele has said his voice carrying an edge. I blinked. Canterlot ghouls needed neither food nor clothing, and the Ministry Hub provided shelter, whether in Stable City or not. But I had learned that ponies need more than these things. Ponies needed companionship, and some sort of social framework, and that's what Stable City provided them. As much as water, ponies had a thirst for friendship. In Shunning Star, the ghouls of Stable City had taken from her the one thing they could, the one thing she probably needed most. Because the ghouls of Stable City believe her daughter created the Alicorns. Was always proud of my daughter, Star Sparkle told us firmly as she magically drew back the curtain which bisected her no. humble living space. No. And nothing that those monsters outside have done will ever change that. Twilight Sparkle was behind the curtain. Every inch of wall space was covered in images of her, everything from ministry posters to ancient and yellowed home photographs, all of which seemed to be of Twilight as young filly. There were open scrapbooks of newspaper articles featuring Star Sparkle's daughter. A large oil painting of a smiling Twilight Sparkle hung in a decorative oval frame at the back of the wall. Ministry Mayor Twilight Sparkle tchotchkes filled small shelves and crates. And in the center was a precious Twilight Sparkle statuette her base reading a familiar, be smart. Golly, Clammy breathed. But when the alicorns started appearing in Cantalot and they began killing us, the other ponies of Stable City decided I was no longer welcome among them. Star Sparkle explained sorrowfully. They said I posed a danger to the city. Alicorns have never paid me unusual attention, but... She looked away. Well... Maybe they're right. Sounds to me more like they were all looking for some pony to take it out on. Calamity grumbled. Star gave Calamity an aching smile. Please He's don't judge up. them all too harshly. After all, they've allowed me to still live in this building. I've never been harassed. Maybe 
Once a year, some pony will even bring me things. She smiled warmly at Stilos. Like Apple Snack here. Such a sweet young buck he is. You deserve better, Stilos asserted. My heart echoed the sentiment, filling with an aching sadness. But the little pony in my head found the scene in front of me more than a little creepy. Standing beside her daughter in the face of public persecution was admirable. But what I saw before me was more like a shrine. I felt like I was looking into the face of obsession. Star Sparkle seemed to read something in my expression or body language. Your friend here thinks I'm a little crazy, she told Steelhoofs. I opened my muscle to protest. Don't fret, dearie, she said to me kindly. I understand. It looks like a lot when all of it is in such a small place. I shut my muzzle, sharing a glance with Calamity before lowering my head with an apologetic expression that wasn't quite sincere. This would seem excessive, even if spread over multiple rooms twice this size. Star Sparkle let out a sigh, looking over the Twilight Sparkle Shrine. No, you're right, but it's not what you think. She bit her lower lip, closed her eyes. I loved my daughter more than life itself, as did my husband. She opened her eyes, looking at the oval oil painting. And I admired her, the princess's favorite pupil, the bearer of one of the elements of harmony, the mayor of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. I was so proud. I heard a tremble in her voice, her gaze lowered to the floor. But I was afraid of her, too, Star Sparkle admitted slowly. We both were, although my husband was less scared than I was. Just once, when she was young, she lost control. She changed me into a pot of plant, entirely by accident, but if it hadn't been for the princess... The mare who had given birth to Twilight Sparkle looked up at me, her eyes again damp with tears. I know I shouldn't have been, but I was frightened, and even though I never stopped loving her, I let myself grow distant. She frowned. Some mother I was. My daughter received more correspondence from the princess herself than she did from me. I never visited her, all the time she was in Ponyville. I never met her friends. She shook her head. <coughs> she never forgot us, though. When they built Stable One, my toilet made sure my husband and I were amongst the first to be guaranteed placed inside. We were on the way here when the cloud overtook us. My husband died on the steps just outside the ministry, making sure I was through the door. She looked away, softly muttering. Of course, they steal the stable early. I found myself looking at her wheelchair and thinking of the stallion skeleton outside with his hooves sunk into the concrete. I was suddenly very, very angry with the ponies of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. How dare they seal up the stable, trapping such good ponies outside, family and loved ones who the stable was supposed to save. They deserved... Well, they deserved what they got. I suppose I've been trying to make up for all the distance I let fall between us when my daughter was still alive. I looked at the shrine with fresh eyes. This wasn't obsession. It was overcompensation. I came in here, and I talked to her. Star Sparkle told us. Sometimes I tell her how my day was, although not so much anymore since all my days are pretty much the same. Sometimes I read to her. She did so love books. Star smiled sadly. Sometimes I just tell her I'm sorry, and that I love her. She looked away, a few tears escaping to drip from her cheeks. Sometimes, she admitted softly, I even think I hear her say something back. We're taking her with us, Steelho stomped. We were standing on the mezzanine as we waited for Velvet Remedy and Pyrelight to join us. Please take her. Please take her. We are not taking her with us, I stomped back. She deserves better than that, Steelho insisted pointing his hoof in the direction of Star Sparkle's hovel. She doesn't deserve to face what we have to, 
I argued, shaking my head. Where we're going next is, is too dangerous. I was cut off by a majestic hoot as Pilot landed on my head, her talons pricking my scalp through my mane. I turned to see Velvet Remedy trotting up, a rather large package hovering behind her. Steelers nickered angrily. Well, of course we're not taking her with us now. The Alicorns will be waiting for us right outside. I'm not trying to get her killed. Well, I might have something to help with that. Calamity interrupted, pulling the case of new missiles out of his pack and setting up four steel hooves. Ooh, Velvet Remedy sang. We're giving presents. Perfect, because I have one for little Pip. I blinked. A present? For me? She floated the package over to me as she joined us. I just had to get you something new to wear, she chimed. Especially after throwing your dress to the dragons. I tried not to grimace. Of all the things I was worried about right now, a pretty dress was really not amongst them. I had rather given up on pretty dresses at this point. The equestrian wasteland favored a more rugged and armored look. Still, maybe it would be something to look nice in for homage. But when I opened the package, I found that Velvet Remedy had surprised me. It's Cantalot Police Barding, Velvet Remedy told me as I pulled out the old uniform. It was in amazing condition. Some of the best light barding in Equestria, she whinnied theatrically. You won't believe how hard it is to find anything practical in your size. Wow. I... I blinked. It was a wonderful gift. <laughs> Yet at the same time, I had grown rather attached to my armored stable utility barding. Although, thankfully, not literally impermanently. Ditsidu had armored it for me, after all. Velvet seemed prodded. Go ahead. Put it on. Almost as if she had read my mind, Velvet said, I know your old stable suit has been a constant companion, but haven't you put it through enough? That suit's been torn up and mended as often as you have, and it deserves a rest. Wouldn't you agree? I nodded solemnly and started to disrobe. We're still not taking her with us, I said firmly. Taking who? Velvet asked. Star Sparkle, Steels told her. Who? Take her where? We'll take her to Ten Pony Tower, Steel have said emphatically. Do you really think they'll just let her in? A can of lot goo, living that posh stuck up. Yes, they will. Steel have slowly intoned in a low voice that told me it would be very bad for the citizens of Ten Pony to refuse her. She is Twilight Sparkle's mother. Remember what Ten Pony Tower is. They will. I nodded. I agree, I stated. Suspecting that the Twilight Society would go to great lengths to have a direct relative of the Ministry Mayor in their tower. I'm sure Amage would help, too. And... I chuckled, shaking my head. I can set up with a place. I own a cheese shop. Both Calamity and Velvet Remy looked at me oddly. You got a what now? As I pulled the stable utility over my head, I informed Steelhoofs. But we're not taking her with us. I tossed my utility barding onto the floor and stared at it. It was ragged, so patched up it looked like it was sewn from rags. There were deep stains, not all of which were blood. It was utterly repulsive. Not now. I looked to Steelhoofs, who was still snorting impatiently. We'll come back for her, though. I promise. Until then, she's safe here. Why not? Steelhoofs asked insistently. Because we're not going to Ten Pony Tower. As soon as we're done in Canterlot, we're going straight to Splendid Valley. No more delays. After we pick up Zenith, Clammy reminded me. Okay, one delay. After we pick up Zenith, I added. Splendid Valley. I leveled a look at Steel Hooves. You know what's there. I'm not taking Twilight Sparkle's mother anywhere near that place. I'm not taking her anywhere until the goddess has been dealt with. Steel Hooves seemed to accept that answer, backing down with a nod. 
I folded the barding up as best the armor plates would allow, and slipped into my duffel bag filled with tools for calamity. Oh. I looked up, floating my old armor in the stealth buck two out of the duffel bag before passing it to calamity. I've got a present for you, too. Calamity took one look inside, and let out a whinnying squeal of glee. I started putting on the Canterlot police barding, which really did fit quite well, and... Oh, what was that feeling? Oh yes, I remember now. It's the feeling of wearing something clean. Steelers walked over <laughs> to the nearest stable city guard and spoke with him, getting a nod. I trotted in place, getting used to the feeling of the new armored barding. Thank you, Velvet. This is... nice. I paused, noting the color. How's it look? Does it go with my mane? Stilos neighed, returning as the guard trotted over the railing of the mezzanine. Honest opinion? I can't picture it on you. Not enough bloodstains. I gave Stilos a dirty look. Oh my god. Just give her some time. That was dark. It's gonna look exactly like the old party. That was dark. That was so dark. Oh god. I, I love shifted Steelers. my attention to the guard. I'm crying with laughter. The guard's horn began to glow. Sparks of magical light floated down and spread out amongst the skeleton-covered floor below. The static from beneath had stopped. How... I shut him off, the guard said simple. I'll turn the broadcasters back on after you leave. Shut them... off? My hoof slapped my face as I remembered, cowering in the corner of the Ministry of Magic lab, shooting frantically at a broadcaster. Of course, you could just turn them off. Ah, <sighs> I was not a clever pony. I was, in fact, a very stupid pony. As we walked down the steps and made our way through the sea of bones, I stopped and pulled out one of the broadcasters from its pit buck, turning it over, familiarizing myself with its design. Well... Ain't this obviously an ambush, Calamity said dryly, looking out into the pink. Where do you think they all went? There was no sign outside of even a single alicorn. Hiding up on the roof or round the side of the building, you think? Maybe the one they call Nightseer got tired of losing alicorns to us and called them back, Velvet Remedy suggested hopefully. Something in the tone of her voice betrayed that she didn't really think that was possible either. So, Calamity looked to me. What's the plan now? Pinkie Pie's office. Ministry of Morale. Manhattan. Only not. As I pushed open the door with a pink hoof, everything seemed off. Disoriented. It was as if the normal color scheme of the world had become a twisted painting of grotesque pastels. I felt awful, and yet I felt horribly alive. A buzz ran through my nerves and up my spine. My ears itched. There was a tremor in the back of my right hind leg, and an odd burning sensation growing in my left hoof. I knew this feeling. My host was riding the razor cliff of a party time mintals high. No! The edge before the awful crash. Of course. Why did, I, why did I expect otherwise? This was wrong. The world tasted funny, smelled funny, like peppermint and rotted cabbage. Stupid bitchy Twilight, I'm fine. I'll show her. My host looked around, scowling. It was as if she even realized something was terribly out of place, but couldn't quite put her hoof to what. Oh, I know. I'll record my memory and send it to her. A nice long one. She'll see there's nothing wrong with me, and she won't be able to leave until she's done seeing. No. No, Pinky. You are not fine. Nothing about this is fine. Hmm. Leave her be, a voice whispered from beside me. If she wants to throw you away because she does not like your parties anymore, then good riddance. The voice was female, and it was coming from... The plant? Yes. One of the potted plants in Pinkie Pie's room was actually talking to her. Oh, no. I saw the plant move. The leaves rustle as the voice drifted up from it. You don't need her. You don't need any of them. That's My a zebra. Barely gave her. 
it a glance. But I thought she was my friend. Hmm, indeed. Came another voice from a marbled paperweight on Pinkie Pie's desk. None of them see what you can see. They don't understand the pressure you're under. Okay, I don't believe I didn't catch this. Why well, did I didn't catch this? This is Pink Amina, not Pinkie Pie, Pink Amina! This is Pink Amina! Okay! This is where she's going crazy and talking to inanimate objects! No, Pinkie Pie agreed. No, they don't. Oh, goddesses. Pinkie Pie was having a mental break. I was seeing what she was seeing in her head. Pinkie Pie continued to look around, then stopped, staring at a tall, thin object concealed by a sheet. Mm, where did you come from? She plodded over and grasped the sheet in her teeth, pulling it free. Before her stood a mirror. I saw my host staring back at me. Pinkie Pie, but not as I was used to seeing her. Her coat's coloration was off. Her mane hung straight and limp. Her expression was a cross and dour one. This was Pinkie Pie, right after her last party. There was a ribbon wrapped around the mirror, with a note on it. Dearest Pinky, thought this might help you find your way. Rarity. Pinkie Pie scowled as she read the note. I'm not lost. She grasped the ribbon in her teeth and tore it away, then stared at herself on the mirror. You too, Rarity? She mumbled. Are all of my friends going to abandon me? Can't trust any pony anymore, the paperweight grumbled. <sighs> Pinkie Pie trotted to a nearby intercom, pressing her hoof against the button. Hey, there's a mirror in my office that isn't supposed to be here. Call some pony to pick it up. Yes, ma'am. A mare's voice crackled over the intercom, sounding oddly distant. Where is it supposed to be? Oh, I don't care. Take it to one of the fun farms or something, Pinky grumbled. Just get rid of it. My host trotted back up to the mirror, staring. She reached out a hoof, touching the surface, and jumped back at the shock of cold. The image in the mirror changed abruptly. Now, looking back at us, was Pinkie Pie. Smiling, cheery, objectionably pink, poofy-haired Pinkie Pie. Oh, hey! The Pinkie Pie in the mirror called out happily. Hey, Pinkamina! Oh, you don't look so good. Which is bad, because you're me, and that means I don't look so good. No! She had enchanted the small mirror. To look it's... in it, you would oh see my God! just as with any mirror. But if you touched it... Oh, so that's, I, I'm clicking the wrong one. Clicking the wrong screen here. Uh, the okay, okay. Oh, my God. That's the same mirror that... <gasps> Pip looked through when she found her inner self. Oh my god. Oh my god. I did I not see that before. Oh, that's where that mirror came from. That's where that mirror came from. Took a picture of your soul. Then a second enchantment allowed the mirror to show that image. The mirror, Pinkie Pie, looked at my host with concern. What's wrong with us? Ooh, who the hell are you? Pinkie Pie, my host, grumbled. <sighs> Goddesses, this was bizarre, if not downright creepy. I decided to think of them in different names, just to keep my thoughts straight. Although part of me worried that was buying into this insanity. Why, I'm you, of course. Pinkie Pie giggled. I'm the real you, which is weird since I'm totally high, too. The reflection was high on PTMs? Or was that Pink Amina's high warping the reflection that can't really be having a conversation in the first place since reflections can't talk? Just like paperweights and potted plants. This is a trick, Pink Amina hissed. Ooh, you mean like a practical joke? See, they really do care about you still. Pinkie Pie paused, then brightened. Oh, hey, little Pip. Um, hello? The conversation had taken a left turn into Weirdsville. Yes! Little Pip says, I'm creeping out uh, here! hello. Pinkie Pie proclaimed, beaming. Wait, what? 
It can hear her! It can hear her! Ah! What the fuck? Pinkie Pie giggled. This was impossible. You remind me of our friend Twilight Sparkle, little Pip. Ah, she's not our friend. Pinkamina sighed. Not anymore. Pinkie Pie's eyes widened. She is so our friend. If she wasn't, she wouldn't be trying to help us. Pinkamina opened her mouth, but Pinkie Pie shook her head. And don't try telling yourself you don't need help. I know better. And that means you know better. I'm... I'm just trying to make ponies happy. Make them happy? Little Pip has a point, Pinkie Pie said seriously. You can't make some pony happy. You can only help them find happiness. <laughs> Pinkie Pie pointed at the window. Look out there. Do they look happy? No, Pinkamina mumbled, looking any place but the window. They're not happy, Pinkie Pie admitted sadly. I think... I think they're actually scared of us. This was... This was what led to Pinkie Pie realizing she needed help. This conversation, that somehow, insanely, I was part of, was what pushed Pinkie Pie to... Shh! Pinkie Pie's... Guys, I am more concerned and confused than anything right now. HOW IS THIS HAPPENING?! HOW IS LITTLE PIP EVEN ABLE TO COMMUNICATE WITH PINKIE PIE THROUGH A MEMORY ORB?! HOW?! HOW?! Scowled at me from the mirror. You have to keep secrets, little Pip. What? No, 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 no. If... If there was any chance that I somehow... was communicating... then there were things that Pinkie Pie needed to know. I could warn her. I could save... Not listening, Pinkie Pie said, covering her ears theatrically. You can't tell, little Pip. But... but everything ends so horribly. No, no it doesn't. Pinkie Pie shook her head fervently. Then, suddenly, she was smiling again. Everything's gonna end in sunshine and rainbows, she announced gleefully. I was struck by the strangest sense of deja vu. She pointed the hoof at me, or at Pinkamina. As long as you're willing to face the fire, that is. What fire? Pinkamina asked. Don't listen to her. The pot of planted. Was this foreshadowing? Kate Cat, are you foreshadowing through Pinkie Pie? Oh, ho, 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 the crazy gets crazier. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That was, that was weird of me. Insisted. She just wants you to fail. Nope. Pinkie Pie insisted. We have to do what is more important first. We have to save the other ponies before we save ourselves. You know what I mean with those bad, bad ponies at four stars. But then... Pinkie Pie smiled sadly. Then we do have to save us, don't we? Sunshine and rainbows. I wanted to tell her how absolutely impossible that was. Hell, the two things this world didn't have anymore were. Never question the pink. Never question the pink. Pinkie Pie grew very cross, glaring at me through the mirror. Sunshine and rainbows. Pinkamina dropped the carpet. We... I... She began to cry. How? How can I fix this? How can I giggle at the ghosties when I'm the ghostie? Don't bring that back up! If a hug could heal pain, <laughs> then laughter could heal fear. But the ministries cast a big shadow. There were many, many ponies who needed to giggle. We need to stop. Pinkie Pie said solemnly. The whole Ministry of Morale isn't helping. It's hurting ponies. And we need to stop. 
We need to get clean. Then record this memory for little Pip. Then... The whole ministry? Pinkamina moaned. We need to tear it all down. A big going away party. The biggest ever. Oh my god, guys. This is some big information. There's a lot of information in here and a lot of answers that was given to me. But still, I don't. Uh, but there's, I still, I'm still questioning how the fuck Pinky could do that. But seriously, of course she's not human. My wife, by the way, uh, she, she, I've been showing her the show, and she suspects that she's killed someone. So, I, so you guys know. Well, anyway, oh my God, that that was a lot of info that was like introduced. Oh, oh my God. I cannot believe what just happened. I am... Uh, it's giving me chills. Uh. Well, anyway, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome video. And please, guys, comment all you want in the, in, below. I want to... I read all your comments. But we, uh, some of you don't think... But probably won't believe that. But I do read your comments. And I appreciate all the comments. Especially you, Oscar, who write, keeps writing me poetry. I love it. I just, I just really, uh, really love of this series, guys. I'm, I'm glad I'm doing it alongside you guys. And anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later. And stay nerdy, my friends. Bye.